Thank you all. I'm, I'm going to give an overview of the Greenway and the uh, Conservancy, and then Linda's going to talk about some of the lessons um, that we've learned about uh, the, the planning for the public realm. So, um, the Conservancy is the nonprofit steward. In 2004, we were set up as a fundraising organization. In 2008, we were enabled by legislation to be the, the steward of the parks. So that means that, unlike a lot of friends of groups for parks, um, we have the actual maintenance and horticulture and programming responsibilities. Um, in 2009, we entered into a lease um, following that 2008 legislation with uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation at the, at the time, the, uh, the Turnpike Authority, um, and <clears throat> we took operation, uh, took over operation of the park um, early that year. Um, it is a, we are a 501c3, a nonprofit, um, part of a public-private partnership, um, and that partnership has been successful in leveraging um, leveraging the public money. So um, the, the blue is the government support to date, and the red is the private philanthropy. Um, the green is, is earnings on um, endowment, and um, the, the tiny green sliver in, of other is principally earned income, um, which has been a rapidly growing source in the years that uh, we've been operating the park. Um, you'll see, I mean, what this means is that each dollar of public money is leveraging more than a dollar of private money, um, which is terrific. Um, what do we do? So, as I said, we have um, maintenance and horticulture and programming uh, responsibilities. Um, what that means is it's, it's stewardship and beauty and vibrancy that we're working on. So, um, this is uh, the Rings Fountain in the park, um, in the Wharf District Parks, a wonderful feature. Um, also incredibly complex. The park is a 15 acre, one and a half mile long roof garden um, over the interstate highway tunnel. And um, what was built in were a lot of wonderful and very complex systems. And um, this is this spring, uh, the park is almost five years old now. And this spring, uh, 100,000 pounds of granite and concrete pavers had to be lifted off the Rings Fountain to do all sorts of repair work. Um, the hoses and the lights and the shooters and so on don't last forever. And so done entirely by our staff. Um, that's the maintenance side. Uh, on the horticulture side, uh, we've maintained the park completely organically. And that is one, it is the only park in uh, Boston, uh, the only public park in Boston that's maintained organically. It is one of the only uh, public parks in the country that's maintained organically. Um, we're really proud of that. We also think that if you walk along the Greenway, it shows, um, it looks really good, um, and uh, we actually, this year, a lot of people, I think, hear organic and assume that that is um, costly. I mean, the, the, analog the analogy that people use is the grocery store. We actually, this year, partnered with the um, Kennedy School at Harvard, um, and through a study with them, showed that actually the organic approach that we use is more cost-effective than a non-organic approach. Uh, the intuition on that, is not the grocery store. The intuition on that is, instead of buying expensive chemicals, we're buying a bunch of um, things like oats and molasses and other things like that that comprise the compost tea that we apply instead of chemicals. So it, uh, it also gets us fabulous horticulturalists who believe in this type of thing. Um, from the sort of stewardship and care to um, filling the parks with activity. Um, this is a chart we, we showed a lot. You may have seen, actually, the Globe ran this chart in August. We were so, so glad to see them pick up on this. Um, we have introduced um, uh, a number of things to the park over the years. Um, we are now hosting, this year we will host over 370 free events in the park. Um, so more than one a day on average, though those are, of course, um, happening largely during the, during the nicer weather. Um, we also, we put out one of the, we built one of the largest free Wi-Fi networks in Massachusetts. Um, our food trucks have been incredibly popular. We helped kind of kick off the food truck craze that, that uh, has swept through Boston. And um, uh, this shows a number for our, our rental carousel, but um, we have worked on, and I'll get to in a moment, um, a, a fabulous new carousel. Um, our efforts to, to bring people to the park and get them to enjoy the park also include a commitment to public art. Um, we released a five-year plan for public art. 
um, last year, and um, it's focused on temporary exhibitions of contemporary public art. Temporary because the park is very new, it's still becoming, and um, as we learn um, how it's used, and um, it, it, uh, we're not ready, and I don't think the public is ready, to decide what art should be there permanently. Um, contemporary art, because it's a contemporary park. Um, Boston has some wonderful historic public art, and has some wonderful historic parks. Um, the Greenway is a different type of space, and um, a great opportunity to exhibit contemporary art. Uh, this is the Green Square Mural by Matthew Ritchie, done in partnership with the ICA that went up um, about a month ago. Um, and then the project that I referenced, um, another example of the work that we're doing, so if it is um, stewardship and, uh, or if it is sort of maintaining and um, programming and improving. Um, we opened Labor Day weekend, um, uh, great work by Linda and Laura, who's in the audience, um, helping drive this project forward. Um, new carousel on the Greenway across from Faneuil Hall. Hopefully you've all not just seen it, but written it, um, come out. It is, um, it's wonderful. It is a great example of the type of placemaking that um, we're engaged in. It's not just a carousel with which we worked with Boston school children to take their drawings with a local artist and carousel expert from the, um, Newburyport to transform those drawings into animals that are all native to Boston. Cod, lobster. Um, Peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcon. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, there they all are, right? <laughs> so I'll, I'll look this way instead of this way. Um, but it's also surrounded by um, wonderful uh, landscape. It's all native plantings, as the entire wharf district is. Um, a grove of trees, um, tables, chairs, umbrellas. Uh, it is supported 95% with private money. The only public money that went into this was a competitively awarded grant from the Mass Cultural Council. So a great example of the type of work that the Conservancy is trying to do. Um, thank you to our lead donor, Amelie Koss, and to the Tiffany & Company Foundation um, out of New York making a major gift here in Boston to support this. Seeing how this could be wonderful for the children of Boston is also the um, most accessible carousel in New England, um, which we're proud of. Um, with that, I, I will turn over to, to Linda, but I, I will mention one thing. Um, you know, the idea of, um, I mean, we are um, in, in great partnership with, um, with Phil and with, uh, with the Harbor Island Alliance, and um, it, one of the things that I think has been talked about uh, in community meetings and, and um, that we have been talking about is the importance of having a kind of welcoming ranger-like presence that is done so well at the pavilion, but that um, for all those that are in the area, so many tourists, um, and don't know their way around all the destinations that are there. Additionally, with more features and more attractions and more being built um, and more people coming, um, the chance for uh, not just that welcoming presence, but also additional boots on the ground for uh, security and keeping an eye on making sure there aren't people that are sleeping in the bushes or engaged in other um, uh, less savory activities in the area. Um, you know, I think this is, a, this is something we've really heard from the community as a priority. It's something that the, the National Park Service does really well, but in a very small portion of the, the Wharf District Parks and of the, the Greenway in general. And um, we have been thinking um, with our board, and, um, uh, Suzanne, uh, about how to fulfill that need. And of course, it, um, uh, so with that, why don't I hand off to Linda to talk about some of the lessons we've learned um, that, uh, from working on the carousel and from working on uh, other place making on the green. What I thought I'd do, because the, the public realm component of this planning uh, effort is something that we feel uh, we're excited about, we want to support really strongly, and having run the parks and public spaces adjacent, public realm area right adjacent to the harbor, we've learned a lot in, the, in these four years about kind of what's working, what's not, and sort of what, how I think we can help inform the, the planning process. Just from a big um, picture standpoint, and I know you know Vivian, your group has been working at sort of this this whole scale as well. Um, if you're thinking about this area as a whole, it's really unique because you've got an urban, a park system, more urban, and then um, an open space system, and so and they're they're kind of layered. And 
um, in thinking about the development projects and public realm and whatnot, um, nobody can be all things to all people um, in, in these in looking at it individually, like looking at just the greenway, what we can accomplish, just the waterfront, just the development. And so this public realm plan, I think, can help kind of apportion and make sense of it in a, in a larger term framework, which can inform um, individual developments. Um, and it's just, I think we all want this place to be really great. Balancing of sort of quiet and passive experiences is something that, again, how you calibrate that up and down this whole linear corridor, people want both um, and you want the flexibility. So again, everyone and different developments shouldn't think about doing all the activation in one place or all the quiet in one place to, to sort of spread it out and calibrate it. This is a space which is really interesting. It was designed really more to function, um, this is uh, right opposite kind of the Roseworth Arch, to function more as a passive space. But it turns out the design um, is equally um, opportunistic to fun function as a, an active space. And this was not the area that was designed originally or thought through. And it works wonderfully in both um, perspectives. Just some images from the Wharf District sort of talking about real high activity sometimes, um, quiet, passive, walking through spaces and other areas, individual experiences, group experiences, food, little vignettes about food or tables and chairs makes it a sort of north end just as another example. You've got sort of quiet sitting, which people want, and lots of activity, and often in the same space, and it's just calibrating that, which will happen, also want to happen on the waterfront um, as well. Uh, edges is just an issue that we found really, really matter. Um, and if there's a, a not, a lot, a not a whole lot of space out here, we found in the Greenway that there's edges, you know, for example, um, along the edge of Harbor Towers, which you talked about before, and you know, in thinking about this edge, um, maybe broadening the thought beyond just it, let's make it look nice, um, to how does this piece of green figure, um, when you go across the street or you walk along this edge, just maybe broadening the aperture a little bit about thinking um, uh, that. The same as in this, this was a design that was inherited. Um, along the edge it's green and it's nice but it's also the, the benches are on the outside from under the shade and this whole interior space you can't get to and so thinking about maybe the seating belongs in here um, and carving out so how those spaces are used it complements um, it will complement the green white and the edges and it will also complement the water cup. Um, flexibility this is sort of a general comment, um, whether it be how you design ground floor spaces um, to how you design sidewalks. This goes, this space um, was a big open, uh, nothing going on to by slowly adding different elements to it and experimenting and trying out things, it can suddenly turn into a real place and an exciting area. And so you don't always have to, what we found, you don't always have to have permanent infrastructure, like a permanent fountain or a permanent anything to make a space and make it be wonderful that by um, adding things that are light touch and flexible can be almost as transformative but then still give you the flexibility to do other things um, if you get tired of something or if you want to try something new. Um, landscape elements, um, you can actually use them as part of the public realm. You don't want to homogenize everything nor do you necessarily want it to be like Times Square around every building and so Again, how you think about using whether, um, you know, what, what happened for us in the Greenway, sort of every single part was different, all the furnishings were different, all the signs were different, the benches different, everything different, and we've tried to thread through um, a language of these green umbrellas, which are both functional as well as they kind of brand the space as you go along, and I think thinking about the public realm between the waterfront and the Greenway and the side streets, is there any kind of language that might want to be integrated that is a little bit common thread, but yet it's clearly these are individual spaces. Um, just to reinforce about horticulture on top of uh, Jesse's is it's been terrific to find out that using organic practices are cost effective, but it's also, um, almost from my standpoint, because I don't have to run the money, um, it's ended up in an incredibly resilient uh, landscape, much more robust than you got with um, artificial applications of fertilizer, with heavy watering. I mean, you're looking at, um, just even on the grass, we started out with plugs that were pull out with you know, maybe an inch of root growth after the organic applications of compost tea and whatnot. You're getting you know, sometimes up to 12 inches of root growth, which makes a much uh, 
a resilient grass, you can use it more often, it takes less water. We really calibrate the watering. Thinking about when you're thinking about the perimeter and what plantings. Do you do containers? Do you do in-ground beds? If you do trees, if they're in containers, they take a lot more water and they're not as happy. Uh, there's a whole lot of practices we've learned and when thinking about what are the landscape elements as in plant material, um, it's, it's, it takes a lot of thought with people that have expertise and have learned. Um, so often people think there's this um, wonderful, terrible term about sort of that I think the landscape architects talk to architects is it's kind of parsley around the pig. And um, I think as we're trying to ch change that dialogue a little bit that um, they can really talk to one another. And it's important to integrate that thinking early in the process. Um, furnishings are amazing. Again, you take plazas. This is in Chinatown Plaza. This was a right in front of Rose Wharf. This is where what they looked like when we started. And just through the introduction of movable tables and chairs, umbrellas, adding a food truck, um, totally transform the places. And so in thinking about some of the big open spaces on the waterfront, maybe trying out small gestures of different kinds of furniture and sort of experimenting with that. And then maybe when every developer, or every space, be it Bud's shop or the Harbor Garage or the different, or Rose Wharf, they don't, maybe there's some common themes that are used or shared spaces so everyone doesn't have to do their own thing. But it's, again, you don't have to do big gestures always to make it a really welcoming space. Um, programming. Uh, one of the things in terms of this, any new spaces created along the waterfront in the public realm, um, it was pretty clear that during the original design process, and this is lesson learned for the Greenway, there wasn't a programming person sitting at the table when the parks were designed thinking about if you want us to hold a vent out here or food vendors, there's no electric, there's no places to, there's no power resources in most of the parks, there's no water, uh, potable water to use to support us. What's the right balance of hard surfaces and planted surfaces to, and so having, when you're, when you're doing a design, or even in the public ground plan, having someone who actually runs public programs and events sitting at the table saying, that's great, but that space is way too small to fit a tent if you want to have this many people, or that's good, but I can't get my truck in there to service this to, to make this a successful space. So it's that kind of expertise. The same with maintenance, to have uh, the programming folks as well as maintenance people at the table early on in the process to help inform how decisions are made. Um, the notion of sort of integration of public and private, we talked about that earlier and, and how um, the model with Rose Wharf has been really a tremendously successful model of kind of works for everybody. There's, there's private spaces to tuck into that works for, well for the hotel economically, but the public's welcomed in it as well. And so thinking about the design of public realm on the waterfront and the greenway and sidewalks, how to um, sort of maximize that interface and um, make it welcoming as possible. Showing Bud, you you know you tucked in this and it, your your little outdoor space and it still feels like the public can hang out there. You can close it for private events, but it just it feels like it works in the in a in the public sector environment. Vivian made me do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yay! Um, this is kind of I, there's no labels on this, and this is one of the, the issue of circulation. And it's kind of when people brought up the the big word transportation with the big T. I think everyone was freaking out about we don't do, want to do 20 more years of traffic studies. This is really with a small team that's talking about circulation locally. Um, this area, and it, I mean, it was a highway project. It was, it was designed by that. It's wonderful public spaces, but there's a big um, design predisposition towards automobile traffic in there. And it's not to eliminate a lot of the connections and circulation. Maybe there's a different way to think about it in this waterfront area. So just by comparison, this is the, sort of the traditional land use the way. This is parks. You know, these are buildings, these are streets, and this is just sort of, um, you know, outdoor space. And I just had, you know, I had Laura sort of, what if you just color the buildings one color, and you color the streets and the sidewalks and sort of public uh, space, how much could be captured if you thought about maybe in some of these street areas, maybe there, um, it's a treatment where it's a uniform surface. It's not a clearly defined um, street with curves, and it's clear this is only four cars. It's done all over Europe, it's done in many cities in the United States, and thinking about a common space, a common elevation, that it's shared. And then it gives a little bit more balance to this is a really heavily pedestrian activity. People are walking to boats, people are walking around the space. Um, there's places to park, but 
I'm only putting this out here to be a little bit provocative to um, maybe uh, having circulation be part of the public realm um, conversation. So uh, with that, um, I thought I would just add <laughs> this, <laughs> is that there is, you know, the Greenway Parks have been open about four years. Um, the, there's a lot of wonderful gestures happening on the waterfront. Can't get it right instantly, but you know, staying with it and at it, and you know, look where we were. Mm -hmm. Like you've come a long way, baby. There's like about 15 of these expressions you can use. But I think this collaborative kind of process, with all the people at the table sitting and listening to, um, you know, pros and cons and push and pull, has to be collaborative. And um, I think that there's just a lot of potential for what could be. Great. Thank you. Great suggestions and, and context for the waterfront planning effort. Great. Uh, any questions from the uh, advisory committee? Rod? Thank you. This was good. Completely tying it all together, to, you know, with some graphic treatment. But I'm kind of struck with all these presentations we've had about how excited everybody is about, in essence, more pedestrians coming to the waterfront. And we've all got ideas, private developers, you know, non-profit companies to do that. Can we get some help, Chris, from your consulting team that develops projections about how many more people actually might be coming and what they need so we don't get the innovation history problem that we now have all of a sudden there are many more cars than anybody anticipated. Yeah. Um, I think we all should share that goal. We're all going to debate what should be passive and what should be active, but we need to get a sort of better handle on the numbers. You know, Harbor Islands, just as Phil was talking about, is that going to grow to 250,000? Where are those boats and those gates going? Well, somewhat of a study was run, I think, as part of the Greenway study, Matthew, is that correct? Looking at populations and, you know, how much in the way of, of traffic folks would be attracted to the area and that yeah. activation would be needed to really draw people down rather than greater density. Is that something that, that relates to this? To, yeah, that's linked to development capacity, but I think what Bud's uh, referring to is maybe uh, are there different kinds of data that we could gather about uh, growth of visitors in particular, right? Uh, we want all these pedestrians to come and do all these great things, but really how many people are we actually talking about? <coughs> you know, what that might look like 10, 20 years from yeah. 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 now. How do we manage it? One of the striking statistics over the past 20 years uh, since the mayor, 70,000 new people live in the city. Additional people live in the city. Blossom than did uh, 20 years ago. So, to your point about you know, what's going to happen 10 years from now? Yeah. If we are a younger city or less, yeah, you know, yeah. less. I'm, I'm in the middle. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but if we are, if we are, you know, if a lot of the young professionals are moving into the innovation district in downtown, yeah. they're more apt to use this area of town than, than the old ethnic uh, kind of a. Uh, Family in the neighborhood. You know. And less likely, less likely to be in a car. Right. Just one thing that could help you on this, because I know that somebody mentioned that we didn't have an appetite for an infinite number more transportation studies. You could do aspirational numbers, which would be really interesting. Like you could ask Bud, Bud, what do you want to see in 10 years and 20 years at the aquarium? And then you could ask the Island Alliance, what do you want to see in five? What's your huh. strategic plan call for? And then you could, and then you could ask. It, it, get some numbers that would be aspirational but really instructive and yeah. fairly simple to do. I think also there's a there's two components of this. Um, that's that's a macro right. approach. Absolutely. And I that would be easy we should do that. Uh, there's also a micro approach, which is how do actually people behave in public space. Exactly. And um, in some of our upcoming meetings, uh, we, we actually did a lot of this research over the summer. We tracked uh, how people behave, particularly around the uh, Longmore area and the aquarium. You were spying on us using NSA? Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, these were interns with uh, clipboards, but um, <laughs> that's terrifying. Boards, but uh, we have you know, tracked some of that behavior, and we'll be sharing some of the results of some of those studies with you in the upcoming meeting. But, um, that's, that's another sign to this, which is um, sometimes it is about the macro, but it's um, how many people are at that particular kiosk at 12 noon on a Saturday in the summer. You know, that's that's where the the, the trouble occurs maybe. It's kind of to your point too about if you put this um, landing facility where all these people are coming to go to the islands, is that the right spot for it? Does that end up and I think that's part of the, the maybe the public realm 
component too about how these public spaces work. Is, I mean, I use that as a public sense, what you're saying. Great. Marianne? Linda, I was really struck by the lesson learned with respect to utilities, mm -hmm. power and water and it seems to me that this is something that the BRA can pick up on um, regarding uh, future requirements in uh, mm -hmm. development in projects. Infrastructure that's yeah, going to support to that. Anticipate some of those needs, whether they, they're going to be real or not, but mm -hmm. just like sort of doing your kitchen over, making sure you have enough plugs and so forth. But it just seems like, wow, that was a, that was a real lesson learned. Well, our staff's having to pull in generators generally to run events. Um, when tents are raised, the, the tent tie downs were deleted in all the lawns originally, and so you're having to use these big, huge concrete blocks, which then smash the grass and, and tear up the grass coming in. We're having to truck in potable water to events, and it really, yeah. really, if you want to do free public programming, the cost to make this stuff happen is, is uh, really expensive yeah. and to anticipate it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the big problems is that was they ran out of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were involved with the parks early on, and it, it wasn't as though they didn't anticipate mm -hmm. it. They just, quite frankly, did not have the money. Which, which happens in, right. in every, yep. you know, especially a public construction project, there's a bunch of things in the end that right. get cut off. It was a little bit of a I think there's also, though, it goes to the point that Linda emphasized about flexibility, because in a lot of places we do have performance panels with significant power, but that they are 50 feet from where we end up wanting the power. And so you either have to do you know, really long cable chases or you have to bring in the generator anyway. And so, I mean, utilities may be hard to do flexibly, but it does emphasize the, even where it gets built in, you need to recognize that it's to be flexible. It's over time. Yeah. Okay. If we could just wait for the public comment to the end of the presentation, I'd appreciate it. Great. Are we all set with questions from the advisory committee? Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe. <laughs>